Hello and welcome to the Final Girls podcast where we explore the intersections of horror film and feminism. In this first series, we're bringing on special guests to dive deep into film and TV shows with witchcraft at the heart of them. I'm Anna, co-founder of the Final Girls and your podcast host. In this episode, we're going to tackle the third season of Ryan Murphy's anthology horror series, American Horror Story Coven. Starring screen legends Jessica Lange, Sarah Paulson, Kathy Bates, Angela Bassett, and Murphy's usual repertoire of actors, including Emma Roberts, Evan Peters, and Tysa Formiga, Coven is all about witches. Namely, a coven in New Orleans close to being eradicated and battling internal politics to do with its reigning supreme, that's their head witch, the very fabulous, very bitchy, and very selfish Fiona Good, played by Jessica Lange. There is also a resurrected serial killer, Madame Larie, who's portrayed by Kathy Bates. And excitingly, at least for me, the first screen incarnation of New Orleans legend, the voodoo queen Mary Laveau, who's portrayed here by Angela Bassett. We're going to talk quite a bit about her. A lot of things happen in Coven, so I'm not going to even attempt a plot summary here. Suffice to say, there's tons of evisceration, tons of killings, a lot of magic, and very very excellent outfits. As per usual with American Horror Story, you don't need to have seen any previous season to be able to enjoy Coven or our conversation about it. Each season of the show is entirely self-sufficient and there are connections, but if you're not a fan, don't feel like you need to have watched all nine seasons of the series in order to be able to enjoy a conversation about Coven, its characters, performances, and some of the inspirations behind Ryan Murphy's show. If you have no intention of watching the show, you can still enjoy the conversation. I'm joining this episode by film producer Jen Handorf to discuss the witchiness, the attempted themes, and the real-life inspirations behind some of the characters in Coven. Thank you so much, Jen, for Thank talking for about me. this particular subject that seemingly nobody really wanted to talk to me about. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. I didn't know <laughs> I got the, like, I'm just stoked. I didn't I didn't know it was you the redheaded it. stepchild of, uh, of characters. Hey, I love it. I, all my respect to Coven. The redheaded, crimped hair <laughs> of uh, stepchild. Uh, yeah. Can you try and summarize American Horror Story Coven for us? Oh, yes, I can summarize it. I can even summarize it better than the cast of Cats was able to summarize the movie Cats. Um, uh, Coven is about uh, the modern progeny of a coven that originated in Salem on their last days of survival, trying to revive their traditions and therefore themselves in New Orleans. What's not to love? Beautifully put. <laughs> and it's the third season of Ryan Murphy's American Horror Story. Mm-hmm. So we started with Murder House, continued with Asyl- Asylum, and Coven is set in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And it's all about witches. Love it. Yes. I'm which so is what, there for this. Which is what we're talking about <laughs> here. Um, so were you a fan of AHS? I'm just going to refer to it as such. I love Sounds that. a bit yeah, wanky. It's, I didn't know that was a thing, this AHS abbreviation, and all my research took way longer than it should have because they were constantly <laughs> typing out American Horror Story. Um, but uh, no, I love it. I think it's a it's a it's a strong show. Obviously, it's incredibly variable. So there's highs, there's lows. You know, there's moments you and it were seasons you can enjoy more than others. Um, something for me, I really enjoyed Murder House. I was really creeped out, you know, first season, you get into it, it's a new thing. Really, when we came into Asylum, it was like, oh, they're gonna, this is what they're doing. They're doing a new story every time. Mm-hmm. And then you get to Coven, it's like, oh, they're really changing it up every time. Yeah. Like, we're not just going gothic every time. And the, the only thing I found uh, difficult is that it's such a nuanced series. There's so much detail in the soap opera of these stories that uh, I sometimes find it hard to keep up. So I must admit that I sort of dropped off 
because I've watched the beginning of Freak Show like two or three times and haven't been able to have the time to continue it through. But having just binged watched Coven, mm-hmm. I think maybe I'm going to give it another go. I mean, Freak Show is the one that, not to segue too much, but I think it's the one that everybody struggles with quite mm. a lot. I think I'm in the minority of people who genuinely enjoyed it first time around. Can you skip it? Like, is it, are oh, we allowed yeah, to just go to the next one? Is yeah, that... I mean, I think that's the beauty of American AHS. AHS. <laughs> that's the our, beauty of AHS. Our AHS. Yep. Uh, which is not an STI. It's a, <laughs> it's a TV show it's with a, nine seasons and it's running. A, it's, a, it's a macabre television series. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, no, each season is um, self-contained, mm. but they are all related. But See, this is the thing. But that yeah. didn't become apparent until, if I'm not mistaken, season five. Okay, okay. So I can probably get away with like just putting Freak Show in a little bit of a box for now. Oh, absolutely. Skipping ahead, maybe coming back to it after I've after I've sort of committed to the other ones. That sounds, yeah. that sounds like a plan. But Coven, Coven, love me a bit of Coven. I actually really enjoyed it. Do people do people give it shit? Like do people do people give it a hard time? I think people give American Horror Story shit in general. I mm. think this is the one where maybe the horror diehard horror fans dropped off mm. because it's not really scary. It's extremely camp. This is where the camp took over the horror, I think. I would say yeah, and I think I could see perhaps like that tension doesn't hold through in the same way. Like you don't get as many scenes where you're thinking, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh, look, what you know, they've just appeared behind you. The ghost heard you divulge your secrets. And you don't get any of that sort of dramatic irony in, uh, in Coven that you do maybe in the first two. But I found a lot of the visceral stuff much more effective and I mean, one story in particular, and I think it's because it's so mean spirited. But the the flashbacks about the murdered slaves, uh, like those the are Madame particularly exactly, story. Yeah, yeah, those are particularly unsettling. I think in a way, maybe because they're true. Because of course they are true. Maybe mm. not in the way they were necessarily depicted. But she was a a, a real serial killer. Um, have they done that otherwise? Do they have? Does the series have other truthful events? Do you know? I mean, maybe they do. they do. Sometimes, increasingly so. So in like Apocalypse season... Apocalypse is obviously based on truth. If we look out... Look, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, cult is obviously very much inspired yes. by the 2016 American elections. And there's a lot of recreation of real life cult leaders. Mm. So literally it will segue into these vignettes of uh, like the attempted assassination of Andy Warhol and then make up a bit of history around Valerie Solanas. It will segue into Charles, Mans- Charles Manson. So it will use real life cult leaders to, mm. but also then create alternate histories for them. When you mentioned that uh, Hotel does a little bit of this as well, dipping into reality and drawing from... Absolutely. Especially Hotel does that particularly with old Hollywood. So mm. Rudolph Valentino... Polo Negri and a couple of other kind of real life uh, Hollywood figures and a number of other quote unquote superstar serial killers also appear mm. but they're obviously fictionalized tales of real life people. So I feel like this is this is a good place talking about uh, serial killers and I think this sort of fetishization of these kind of characters because that that isn't that's partly one of the things that I find I don't know if I find it problematic. It definitely sticks in my craw a little bit is watching Kathy Bates, who's such... Kathy Bates, right? Kathy Bates, Kathy yes. Bates. Kathy Bates, who's such a... By the way, from my hometown, Memphis, obviously that means that we're both awesome. But um, uh, but she, she is such gravitas and such incredible acting chops. And to seeing her bring to life a very empathetic version of this horrible human being who we do actually, I think, feel pity for at some point. Like, I'm I'm not sure the storytellers earned making me feel good about her, if shall that we, makes sense. Shall we introduce the characters? Yeah, first? let's go for it. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so in Coven, we meet... There's, there's quite a neat separation between... Well, actually, no, that's not true. So in <laughs> Coven, we meet uh, both an assortment of fictional witches and fictional characters, and witches or characters based on real life figures so there's fiona good who's the supreme of the coven and a supreme is like 
she, the the queen witch, witch. Bitch. yeah <laughs> head witch bitch yes i love that i think that she would love that title actually i think she she i think she might actually <laughs> revert she, to she herself doesn't as say such. that in the series it was definitely in the subtext uh. i think it might be one of the episode titles actually <laughs> um so we've got fiona good her daughter cordelia good who's actually running this sort of um new orleans hogwarts for <laughs> talented young ladies it's like it's like hogwarts for wayward girls yeah it's uh, like xavier school for talented girls youngsters but it's just for young witches is young witches who have all had actually been accused of crimes or have committed crimes unwittingly because of their powers and sometimes wittingly uh with their powers with their powers so they're basically they're basically witchy delinquents who no one can prove have actually committed the crimes that they've committed uh, but they've all sent them to the party capital of America, New Orleans. And which is very wise. Which has gone wild. Yeah. It's just which has gone wild. <laughs> the kind of the, the actual coven, so both the apprentice witches and the kind of the practicing adult witches have been gravely reduced. So they're kind of dying out. Mm. And it's a very small group of them. So we meet um, Madison Montgomery, who's a Hollywood starlet, who has telekinesis. And, and completely unironically uh, played by... Hollywood royalty. I always get the name wrong here. Emma Roberts. Emma Roberts. That's it. Niece of Julia Roberts. Niece of Julia Roberts. But who, definitely not America's sweetheart. Yeah. Super not drawing on life at all. <laughs> like she is. She's like, what? What's it like to be a troubled starlet who gets everything she wants and is super attractive? I wouldn't know. I'm just gonna have to draw on fiction for my character inspiration. <laughs> There's Zoe, who's played by Tysa Farmiga. Mm. Who is sister Vera Farmiga and also appears in AHS Murder House for a season. Well, and she's sort of like our classic all-American girl, kind of innocent but troubled. Yeah, and she's got a murder vagina. She's got a murder vagina. Yeah. That's her particular affliction in this in this <laughs> version of herself. Then we've got Nan, who's played by Jamie Brewer, who is also in season one. Uh, and who's Clay Vorant. And Queenie, who is played by, by Gaburi Sibide, Oscar nominated Gaburi Sibide, uh, who is a human voodoo doll by her own description. Which is outstanding. What a great, what a great little trick. And then in this way, as you say, they're sort of Professor X's, you know, school for young witches. They've each got their predetermined powers, which we see evolve over the course of the season. Yeah. And then we've got fictionalized versions of real life characters so you mentioned before madame delphine lollery who's played by kathy bates who's based in a real life murderess who had a well murdered numerous people namely her uh slaves yeah mostly her. well and this is this is so for anyone who's been to new orleans obviously voodoo is a big part of new orleans we'll get to that bit in a, a, a shortly but also just like the the sense of the macabre is is huge in New Orleans and this sort of decadence and 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 decay and all this kind of thing, and um they actually have a museum in New Orleans for serial killers, um and my husband and I were there for a for a horror film festival uh earlier last year, and and you know obviously we're going to that we also went to the Poison Museum. These are the things we do. Oh, when we did you go to the festival. Voodoo Museum as well? We there's, but see the other thing is there's so many view, Voodoo Museums. That's a really good yes, one. We went to several Voodoo Museums good. as well, um, and uh, but going to the Serial Killer Museum, and this is this is where like my line starts to get a little bit fuzzy and weird. Is it it was very much about people. They were selling merchandise with like serial killers' faces on it, and that's the bit that weirds me out. Like I find being interested in these horrible things that happened and sort of judging them and, and reflecting on them, you know, fine human. We're drawn to this kind of stuff. We rubberneck at car accidents. Great. That's human nature. But then buying the t-shirt, like <laughs> I lived through this misery and I bought the t-shirt. It's sort of, it's a weird inclination. And there's a, there's a, a breath of that, I mm. think to coven where there's a little bit of this like oh wasn't it horrible wasn't it horrible what used to happen to people wasn't it horrible it's like well, it's not that long ago <laughs> like, yeah. it's all sort of and it's it's there's an element of um ah, and maybe this is maybe this is too high a pedestal but it's there's an element of a lot of slaves were murdered by their owners 
why is she so special just because she did it so horrifically and is it wrong that we're telling her story so specifically but none of her victims so specifically Mm -hmm. and there's there's a lot of that that I think you have to park when you watch this. Yeah. Because and there it is, does make it inaccessible, I think. There is also a lot of elements that, and it's part of the criticism that's been placed on this season in particular, is that it does fetishize mm. the murders that Lolori committed. Like, mm. it presents them in quite a glossy way, and then they get mixed up with um, voodoo magic, mm. as enacted by Mary Laveau, who's also based on a real-life figure. Absolutely. Played by Angela Bassett. But obviously, this is now taking Mary Laveau's history as a voodoo priestess as uh, an equivalent of a practicing witch so she's got actual powers and then she sort of avenges Lola Ree's murders well and this is this is rough isn't it because it, it takes the the serial killer and it gives them exactly their life story and kind of puts a bit of glitter on some of it and makes it look a bit nicer and more exotic than it was and then it takes this woman who was effectively a midwife and a doctor and a real woman in a real culture. And, it and goes, a community leader. And a community leader. And it's like, no, no, no. She she definitely killed some chickens and murdered some babies so she could live super forever. You were telling me about this actually before. So so tell tell everybody about how <laughs> how she managed to live twice as long as any other human possibly should. So a, the, the, the once you know the trick. You'll be amazed. Oh yeah, I'm I'm definitely gonna try this out myself. What, what so no, so so Mary Laveau is a particular personal obsession of mine. No, so she was um, a real life woman who lived in New Orleans. She was a free woman of color um, who lived in the 19th century in the city. She was a hairdresser, mm. so she gathered uh, all the secrets of the powerful white families in New Orleans because she could she was you know confided in by the women whose hair she did and it's interesting what they've sort of what the filmmakers have sort of picked from this is that she's a hairdresser but much more in the traditional sort of african community way rather well than we only meet her as a hairdresser in the contemporary in setting the contemporary not setting, in a kind of the, in the 19th century in the yeah. previous setting she was much more like a leader of of a community yeah. rather than actually uh, engaging with the community at large so have you owned this place long what do you think I think when they say good black don't crack, they're not wrong. What's your secret? What's yours? Your manicure costs more than my rent. Woman like you wipes her ass with diamonds. She don't just end up walking in here for hair extensions. My, my, my. Aren't you perceptive? You know exactly who I am and what I'm capable of. Just like I know exactly what you are. Which? I can smell the stink of it on you. Well, I didn't expect you to like me. (laughs) I mean, after all, your kind and my kind have been going after each other for centuries. Though it is kind of like a hammer going after a nail. Everything you got, you got from us. Did you a voodoo slave girl who graced us with her black magic? She couldn't tell a love potion from a recipe for chocolate chip cookies if she had to read it. You made her a slave. Before that, she came from a great tribe, the Arawak. She learned the secrets of the other side from a 2,000-year-old line of shamans, necromancy. She gave it to your girls of Salem, a gift repaid with betrayal. Please, you want to tell me that some illiterate voodoo slave girl gave me my crown? But maybe you haven't heard the news about civilization starting in Africa. We more than just pins and dolls and seeing the future in chicken parts. You've been reading too many tourist guides. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think there's, you know, she was and still is, I think, you know, when you go to New Orleans, uh, New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> when you go to New Orleans, um, she's still revered, you know, she, her grave is covered in tiny crosses mm. and kisses uh, you know well, a whole lot of kind of museums well you know tourist attractions cocktails voodoo touristy shops are named after her there's whole tours based around places where she lived i believe her house is her original house is no longer standing standing yeah. but they will show you around they'll show you her grave like her legacy is very much still alive and she's very well respected there's a number of fascinating books written about her both kind of as just 
an incredibly fascinating woman who achieved quite a lot mm. and gained quite a lot of respect and power in her community. So she was extremely smart and political. And this is, this is depressing that none of this is in there. No, of right? course not. And her life story has never been adapted. And, you know... <sighs> And it's and we, can, can, we can go off on a chant about why that is, um, and it's not like they make her look dumb or thick or, or, or you know it, no like they, she's, she's still powerful she's still interesting but they give it so little backstory space. yeah yeah like, like we get kind of to carry on from your point it's like we get Madame Lola Rees, a racist murderer <laughs> yeah um, we get her backstory and her motivations however petty they may be she wants to be beautiful she wants to be young. That's and she's, basically and she's it. She's jealous that her husband's cheating on her, and she's jealous that her daughters are younger than exactly. her. Yeah, it's all it's all quite base archetypal. We get it, like short shrift. We get it. We know what that is. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not defending Lollary at all. She's the way that her story is presented is always in, it's also incredibly reductive in the sense that mm. she was actually a woman of money mm. and quite a lot of financial savvy and power that's not the point of this conversation or of that series at all she was a racist murderer yeah, who she's, killed she's quite no a good. lot of people she's no good doesn't matter that she was good with finances but essentially she's given a lot more backstory and motivation than Mary Laveau who when she places a curse on Lollary is presented to be motivated mostly because Lollary killed her lover and it, yeah it's just a sexual revenge yeah and it's it's not like it, it and with the lover as well uh she preserves him by putting a bull's head on his head and so it's just this very objectified male and especially like black male yeah. body which is super fit and lovely to look at but you can't help but feel a bit uncomfortable about that but she's kept him living for 150 years as this bull-headed man ha 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 but it is it is kind of incredibly reductive for a woman who is still was a community leader to reduce her to avenging her lover and as opposed to yeah. avenging her community. community or her children or yeah. when there is so much about motherhood in this yeah like it would be it would be i mean there's a load of sex in this but she is actually Aside from when the younger girls use sex as an excuse to perpetuate their bickering, mm. um, she really is the only character who just gets pissed off about having her lover killed enough to start a war. And and it is reductive. And it's a bit sad because they do so much with other things that it's not through lack of skill. Mm. It's just through lack of not picking it up. And it, it isn't as though they depict her as weak or stupid or inconsequential or anything like that. But... They just don't give her the flesh and blood that she deserves as a character. Absolutely. Especially if you're going to use someone real. Yeah. You're going to use someone real. Like, you know, give the writers a day off. <laughs> like, just go to, the, go to the library. Pick up some of those stories. Pop them on in there. No, I'm being, I'm being reductive myself now, obviously. But, but, you know, when you have that backstory and the legends, yeah. but also the real life information. And there's some, you know, incredible historical books that have really traced back trying to piece together the quite mysterious live or even lives of Mary Laveau because mm. one of her most incredible tricks you know there is you know. was that she, one of her daughters was named after her and at one point and I've read a bunch of books about her and they all kind of come back to the thing when you choose to not kind of take the magical elements into account or like don't take them at face value just as a real life account of a woman she essentially passed off or passed on her name to her daughter to continue practicing her wow. magic her you know preaching is not the right word but you know what i mean kind of her thought practice. leadership yeah. her practice her community leadership her you know support mechanisms that she enacted so she essentially was immortal through her children, through her child, who continued to do what she does. But she made people believe that it was her, it was the same person. Well, and Because they look quite similar, apparently, and they obviously shared the same name. And it was sort of like a seamless transition. So she made everyone believe that she was immortal. And and isn't it outstanding that when you've got this this real life story of a mother passing on her legacy to her daughter who's carrying the mantle and you've got obviously the the voodoo elements and the supernatural elements in a series about just all of this and they don't 
do anything with it and instead we've got and they're very interesting characters the characters we do have but they're completely fictionalized yeah um a mother and a daughter fighting over power for their coven um so it's just yeah it's just interesting i wonder if it got left in the writer's room i wonder if it didn't get brought up but they've just left a lot of really interesting story on the floor there for no reason i can discern i mean i'm just constantly waiting for mary laveau's story to be adapted <laughs> to the screen constantly hopefully she will once again be played by angela bassett because i, know, I do think she was incredible she was so good i just i believe in her power um there's a lot of that in this in this series though isn't there there's a lot of really cool women but let's um talk kind of about the witching world that they mm. present in Coven because they're very specific about all the rules of magic and of being witches and well, they have laws don't they with penalties, yeah. quite high penalties and they've got kind of processes and the council established mm. and things like that so kind of what is the what is the witching world that's established to us by Ryan Murphy so we know that there are these well we presume there's more than one coven because we're not being told this is the end of all witches. They just tell us that this is going to be the end of their coven. Uh, so we assume there's a bigger world, which we don't really ever get to see a part of until there's a big recruiting bit at the end. But that's all a bit girl powery rather than mm -hmm. mythology. Um, so every coven has a supreme. And that supreme is it's kind of a divine right thing, isn't it? It's the supreme is obvious... We know exactly who the Supreme is going to be. The Supreme demonstrates themselves because they get stronger as the previous uh, Supreme loses their strength. So it's not meant to be something that's debatable. It's meant to be something that's really just perfectly natural and, and the cycle of life. And it's cyclical as well because it's get it gets not passed on, but it's a power that essentially shifts vessels. Yes. So, exactly. like, when one supreme dies, the next one rises, steps into the yeah. place. Yeah, it's not it's not passed on in the sense that one chooses who they pass it on to, uh, but yeah, in the course of the natural events, it diminishes from one woman and grows within another. Like in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when one Slayer dies, another one um, gets chosen and gets the power of the exactly, Slayer. Exactly, it's inherited, sort of. Yeah. But the whole thing that messes up our whole balance and our entire world is that our current supreme she just don't want to die she like being pretty she like being <laughs> young and she don't want to give up none of it idiots have you any idea what's going on out there now i forgave your ham hand and mass murder business with the bus over exuberance of youth and all that but if you haven't got the goddamn brains to know that when strangers come asking questions, we close ranks, then I fear our line is truly at an end. But they knew so much already. I couldn't toast a piece of bread with the heat they were putting on you. You are soft. You're emotional. You care what people think. Now, if there's one thing you learn before leaving this place, it's that we, even the weakest among us, are better than the best of them. Are we gonna get arrested? You are missing the point. Which is? The point is, in this whole wide, wicked world, the only thing you have to be afraid of is me. But um, she's Jessica Lang, so we exactly, can't forgive her. <laughs> You know, she still, deserves it. She's like, I'm going to keep all this. And this is, so this is another place where, um, so this is a fantastically female series and it's very fun and it's very enjoyable to watch and it's very popcorny, but it is by no means feminist. Um, I don't want, I don't want people to confuse a fun watch uh, for something that actually represents politics or proper gender politics or anything like that. We have a film here that is filled with women who are desperate to regain, and even that word regain, but to return to their youth, to return to what they decide was beautiful, to return to their former selves. Oh, just two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, there you go. There you <laughs> Out go. Out of like eight. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's this idea that once you've lost it, you want it back and it's valuable and without it, you're not valuable. And so 
again, it's a bit frustrating that this very strong modern independent group of women who can literally set things on fire and kill people and bring them back to life are just trying to find that wrinkle cream that's gonna work this time. Do you think, though, that it's all about beauty as opposed to power? Uh, Jessica Lange's a lot about the beauty. There's a lot of focus on her hair. Like, there's a lot of focus on her hair falling out, um, which is a cancer metaphor as well as some other things. But um, I think there's a lot of emphasis on looks throughout and the meaning of looks. Um, uh, Lange's character talks to her daughter. There's a lot... (laughs) Her poor daughter has eyes and then she doesn't have eyes and then she has eyes and then she her eyes get plucked out again it's her a, poor daughter who's played by sarah polson sarah who, polson who's outstanding unbelievable so also good. ryan murphy regular yes absolutely the only season of ahs that she hasn't appeared in was season nine. Oh, really yeah. okay so she's she's after this she still carries on for another yeah, yeah like, she was in season one all throughout every single one of them uh except season nine which was the most she's outstanding one. she gives she gives great terrified face i think is one of the reasons she's in there so much but um but yeah no the the notion that uh her mom sees her after her eyes have have been plucked out and then replucked in and then replucked out um and it's just like oh you look awful and it's like cheers mom and not that I can't identify with that, but there is a lot of focus on the physical attractiveness. Um, it's definitely a lot of it for Fiona. Fiona's incredibly superficial. Mm. Well, as it- someone who was always like, you know, we see her as a young witch and we mm. see her as Jessica Lang. Jessica Lang kind of made up to, you know, she's always fabulous, but she, here she is ryan murphy worshiping at her feet levels Mm. of fabulosity Mm. you know she is just wearing the highest black heels she's looking incredible and then there's an element of kind of uh, her becoming decrepit and Mm. falling apart quite literally and she makes a big deal out of that because you know her beauty was always there and it was always an element of power for her but it was not the source of it Well, this and this is kind of this is a very interesting thing because you generally get into witchcraft uh, and the definitions of good witches and bad witches and like what it means to be a good witch and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, female, the feminine is, you know, the the cup, the chalice, all of this kind of stuff is always obviously a huge part of that. Um, And then I think, you know, out of the idea of reproduction or or creation or this kind of thing comes the idea of beauty as well and with the idea of losing that productivity comes the idea of losing that power and yet i don't ever feel that we quite nail down those elements of these things in this series like it feels like it's always there just floating on the surface like oh she's getting old isn't that dreadful but oh she's got to kill babies to survive but it's not about reproduction like it's it's always sort of skirting around the themes but never quite honoring them within the mythology of the characters if that makes sense yeah and i think it's also a lot simpler maybe and a lot more palatable mm. for mainstream yeah, yeah, for tv sure. audiences I can see that. to tackle the idea of, of a woman a witch mm. losing her shit because she's losing her beauty mm. versus confronting the fact that um they are killing babies or using babies for their own personal gain for power or because you know i think fiona is quite radical in the sense that she is a really fucking terrible mom yes and she clearly never wanted to have a child we're not given the backstory of how or with whom she's given right. she has a child which i always found really interesting it's like how did this happen it's when just you an so inevitability clearly, isn't it yeah when you so clearly hate your child and their relationship is am- amazing and really painful to watch even even and straight through to the final scene as well like like spoilerific but like the oh all of this is like spoilers we're we're all okay so so the last moment that fiona shares with her daughter is you know she's begging her daughter to kill her Her daughter's the new supreme this is the natural order of things her daughter rather than killing her with the knife that she's been offered goes in to embrace her mother who dies in her arms because that embrace was what was needed to kill her. Like, it's just this such... She literally killed her with kindness. And and the last line is, I don't think we've ever hugged before. And then her mom dies. And it's like, 
cool you know like that that is one of this like strongest psychological moments and it should be as the last moment of the, of the series a very psychologically strong moment but i just wish they'd brought that in earlier rather than this constant like oh you sexed up an axe man and sent him to kill me like it was goat's blood don't worry about it like there's there's some um some emotional uh, trifling which is just sort of fumbled through a little bit when they do the the filmmakers definitely show and i say filmmakers you know the television makers hmm. do show that they can handle this stuff with uh, artistic aplomb but then they just sort of fumble through it in loads of areas, leaving you a bit disappointed about outcomes in certain points. I think that's the thing. Great series, but just the the high points show that there's no excuse for the low points in a way. And that's frustrating, I think. Yeah, and I mean, it kind of fits into some of the regular criticism uh, aimed at him, at this series in particular, is that it has so many good ideas and it doesn't really go through with any one of them mm. and i think motherhood in relationship to witches on screen is quite interesting because they're usually portrayed as um in many ways as the anti-mothers where mm. they do not respect the kind of natural order big air quotes here yeah, yeah, yeah of kind of women being naturally maternal and nurturing where they will take advantage I kill babies or children to for their own gain. Mm. And it's presented here in that very literal way, but also we're presented with a witch who very clearly does not give a shit about her child, but nonetheless had one. And her child is there and they're kind of living separate lives. But we don't really go that deep into their relationship, which yeah. seems kind of like a, you know, narratively subversive thing of kind of giving a which really the most powerful witch in the world a child and having that really antagonistic relationship between them but never really fully in developing it you know what it is is what it it feels like we have and maybe this is what it is 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 like we have the same person's sexual and maternal psychoses reflected on multiple characters in the same way like none of the characters are necessarily more successful sexually or emotionally than any of the other characters. We don't have any role models. We don't have any role models in that sense. Um, and you know, you open with a scene where uh, Kathy Bates's character, you know, the, the opening sequence of the of the series, Kathy Bates's character discovers that her daughter has been uh, sexing with a with a, a slave, and and the slave is blamed, and and that turns out to be the lover of. Marie Laveau that that kicks off this whole thing so we open with these themes of sexuality and the se children having sex and rape and can women consent and lovers and murder and blood and all of this and it really just seems to sort of the the whole series seems to be pushed through that mold of sexuality and betrayal and wrongness and shame like, is there ever is there ever anyone who's not having shameful sex, even if they're really enjoying it? I feel like everyone's really shameful about the sex they're having in this whole series. Tell you who, Madison. Do you think th ah, she's she's unashamed, but she's doing it to be hurtful? She's not doing it for pure joy. I, you're you're absolutely right. Mm, you I know, posed the wrong question. No, in a do way, you know I think. when? I think Madison is an interesting character because she's a more vulnerable version of Fiona. Mm. She's not pure power. Mm. She's actually quite a you know stereotypical kind of hurt little girl who you know dabbles in excess to feel yeah. essentially because she stimulate. needs yeah to stimulate kind of to feel emotion to feel herself be alive you know she uh you know does a lot of drugs sleeps around she kind of you know takes advantage of her youth her beauty her kind of celebrity as her power essentially and then there is this one scene uh, for about midway, two thirds through the series, where she develops real feelings for Kyle, the kind of the Frankenstein mm. boyfriend who's played the by perfect boy. Yeah, perfect boy who's made out of parts of different frat boys that she's chosen. Well, she accidentally murders him when she uh murders. Well, she turns over the whole frat bus full of boys that had gang raped her. At a frat party. Except for he's the one who was trying to save her. But yeah. he also happened to be on the bus. Which makes it this very moralistically complicated 
action. And she puts him back together and brings him back to life uh, as a favor. Back together with the rapist's bits, though. Which yeah. is slightly problematic when you think about it on a larger thematic scale. Oh, she is incredibly problematic on <laughs> many scales. But the one tender moment is when she uh, she invites Zoe into the room with her and Kyle. Mm. And basically says, I'm not going to give him up. I've got feelings. He makes me feel good. But we can share him. Do you mind? No, I don't mind. But you do. What are we talking about? Come on, Zoe. What you walked in on before? None of my business. You brought the dude back from the dead. You must like him a little. Brought you back too? Starting to wish you hadn't? Look, it's not like we can be together anyways. Why not? It's gonna be different with Kyle. He already died once. It'll take more than just that thing between your legs to kill him. Don't be disgusting. <laughs> so what? Uh, you're done with him? Not even close. Being with him is the only time I felt anything since I came back. I'm not giving him up. But that doesn't mean you have to either. We'll just take turns. Come here. And it's like quite, it's, you know, it's sort of a bit more subtle than AHS usually is because we don't actually see them cavorting together. Just we the just feet coming we just off see the, the feet, yeah. In that sort of, yeah, it's very which is really sweet. Nice, actually. And yeah. I think there it's quite, ex- it's more explicit than just implied, but we're told that, like, actually, this is quite lovely intimacy between them and it's sex for the pure joy of it and the connection of it as opposed to just her taking advantage of a young man who is very much on the border of whether he can actually consent or not because he's basically being used as a living sex toy zombie boy yeah Yeah. which becomes even more zombies consent who knows Um, and it becomes even more tragic because we're then told that he was sexually abused by his mother and and so the sexual abuse from the mother is one of those things that I wish, and maybe this makes me weird, I wish they'd gone just slightly further with making it absolute because I think it's so implied. Do you think it's not absolute? I don't know. Like the way she kisses him is uncomfortable, but we never we never see or hear any abuse other than this like slightly, do I, am I missing a scene? Oh, Have she literally scene? puts her hand down his pants. Oh, I missed that scene. This is the problem with watching such a long series. Is so, well, this is what I mean as well though. <laughs> Is these are important moments. Every one of these moments is so narratively important. And that probably took like a minute and a half of screen time yeah. in a 40 hour. I don't know how long the thing is. It's usually long. No, like in a, in a it's probably it, like 10 all hours it, or something. There is 13 episodes. They're about an hour each long. It's 13 hours. When there's a, a minute and a half long scene that completely changes the definition of is this subtle or is this definite. There was a bit with... um when Queenie discovers uh, how the voodoo queen was murdered as well. That's super fast. Like, there's these bits where we just flash through. She's like, oh, there's a pile of blood. Oh, shit, she was dismembered and spread across the world. But that's 90 seconds. Yeah, also a very unfitting end for Mary Laveau. Dull, right? Yeah. Like, like, just, like, wait, what? She deserves more. And, and... This is there's inconsistency with powers here as well, isn't there? Mm. Is that like you see someone one minute be able to set a fireplace on fire with a flick of a finger, and then the next minute get strangled and can't do anything to defend themselves? And it's a it's a little inconsistent with how powerful these characters are and how they can use their powers. Like the second they get into trouble, their powers go out the window, which is convenient. There's a very distinct sort of separation between the coven led by Fiona, mm. um, quite literally white magic, because they're all, well, they're not all white. White girl magic, right? White girl magic, yeah. yes. Because <laughs> Queenie's the well, only girl, the only woman of color there. Well, and this is really interesting because. And, and, you it, know, kind of the, the voodoo clang led by Mary Laveau. Kind of recruits, recruits Queenie in a way. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's. One of the things that does bother me is that Queenie, you know, there's these little bits that bother me in an otherwise very palatable series. Um, when Queenie says things like uh, uh, to Mary Laveau, Angela Bassett being brilliant. Um, oh, I don't think it's a black thing. I think they just don't like me. And Angela Bassett's character says, no, 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 it is. It's definitely a black thing. And it's like, well, 
if she doesn't feel like it is, does it have to be? Like, you know, and, and this is where when you get into filmmakers who are making stories about people they don't represent, it becomes a little bit problematic when you're representing these, kind. Of, you know, you're putting these kind of words into their mouth. And Queenie, who's never felt like she's being repressed racially, is being told that even if she doesn't feel like she is, she definitely is. And that feels a bit sad. Like, it's like, you know, she didn't feel like there was a problem. She didn't feel defined as a black woman by her friends. But now she has to. And that's that, uh, problematic. And it, the, yeah, and the intensely weird thing as well about the whole series is that once even Queenie moves over to Marie's camp, it literally becomes a race war. Yes! And, w- and the fact that Mary Laveau is sort of kind of positioned as an antagonist to Fiona Good becomes very fucking problematic <laughs> because it's essentially being asked to root for the white witches mm-hmm. who are all fictional mm-hmm. and the white racist serial killer uh-huh. who they're using as a bartering tool in exactly. their battle against Because she's Mary played Laveau. by the very likable Kathy Bates who... But Angela Bassett is also very likable. No, absolutely. Well, and Angela Bassett, like you, you super respect her character throughout. Like, yeah. You, and you're told she's killing babies. You're like, eh, but she looks hot, so maybe it's worth it. Meanwhile, Kathy Bates is like, no, no, you're definitely a bitch. But look at you go through a burger. I identify with you. Um, like there's this, there's definitely a mixed conceit about how you engage with these characters. But you're absolutely right. It it ends up being a split down the middle issue of race and race racial cultures. Um, speaking that voodoo it comes from a black culture and white witchery comes from white culture and it's all just a bit of made up nonsense isn't it but it creates this division that's a bit weird well there is a really interesting very very minute thing there is one point where they argue about Tichuba I yeah. believe her name is T- Tichuba the well known fictional character from the crucible um uh arthur miller's play written yeah, in the no. 1920s like you know i think that's sort of some like no, no she they talk about her as like the original witch she's like the og witch yeah, yeah. which then she actually Queen isn't East. in the ahs narrative because in in season six she is presented to be a whole nother kind of wood witch character played by lady gaga oh no you're joking yeah she's the og supreme and and she's she's whitewashed by Lady Gaga, but she's not she's not presented to be Tichuba. She's just another oh the original Supreme. Witch. I see. She's yeah, given yeah, yeah, it yeah. re-identified. Yeah. And what did we what did we figure out? It's twenty thirteen. This twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. I mean, five years, you know, six years even. A lot happens in six years culturally, and I do I do think it's slightly dated. Like I think I don't think you would make this now with the same kind of woke hashtag that it probably had at the time no absolutely not i am interested in the fact that you kind of say that it's definitely not feminist (laughs) um i think i think there's a big difference between being female and being Mm -hmm. feminist and i think objectification is a big part of that and i like pretty things as much as the next person but there's a you know there's one pretty <laughs> there's one pretty boy in this whole series and there's a lot of very pretty girls and there's a lot of objectification physically of the women and there's a lot of objectification of the black men as well actually i was yeah. I, I i should say one repeating male character who's good looking um in my opinion um but i think that it's not trying to be feminist, so I think it's fine. Like I'm not, I'm not saying it's failed at that because I don't think that was its attempt. I think as long as you're not watching it as as your next, you know, political tome, then you're fine. <laughs> but I think, oh my god, these women are terrible. None of them are, are role models. They're all awful. They're I all. I kind of love that though. But no, it's great. Well, because a nasty character is way more interesting than a divine one, right? Who wants a goody two shoes? I mean, exactly, and. I always found it kind of very fun to watch, especially Fiona, sort of revel Mm. in how bad, but in a really campy way she was. Mm. Because she's not bad like Lollary bad. She is just... Sassy bad. She's campy bad. She's like, you know, very... She's Elvira, yeah. Like, it's, it's very... She's a vamp. 
She is only bad to get her own. She will only hurt you if you have spited her. She doesn't betray people without reason. She's got her moral rules and she sticks to them. And it isn't until we see her begin to bend those rules when she attacks her own coven that we see her really begin to meet her downfall. But yeah, no, she is a woman of, uh, of, of, I don't want to say morals because that's the wrong, <laughs> that's the wrong implication, but she's certain, certainly a woman who sticks to her guns. Yeah. How do you think she fits into the screen history of kind of over the top, overly feminized almost and campy witches character could have been the fourth witch in witches of eastwick like i don't i don't necessarily think anything new is being done with her but she's sort of i think she's a a a respectful montage of a lot of these strong characters and i think you know there's an aspect of with with um american horror story where because they are using the same cast again and again they have these pieces that they need to construct a a story out of and jessica lang is you know who else was she gonna be of course she's the vampy witch like who else who else what else would there be she's a really formidable actress but i think the way that ryan murphy has used her was very much leaning into the -the over-the-top campiness like the extreme version of her as a kind of joan crawford-esque actor but if you think of her in the first two ones as well like she i mean i'm thinking of her and kind of her um in her film career where she played amazingly subtle and vulnerable yeah. roles that's not how murphy uses her no 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 at in, all in in obviously in in murder house she's this very glamorous woman of of means who's sort of still a decadent you know, she's still she's, fallen. She's, she's very... sort of like a, a southern belle with a dark past. Exactly. She well, she's very much she's very very Norma Desden's Sunset Boulevard. Like my my life has passed me by, but I'm still so fucking elegant. Um, and and then obviously, uh, when you get into um, it's not called Hospital. What's it called? <laughs> the second one. Oh, uh, uh, asylum! Asylum. It's like it's not called hospital. It's like, oh, American uh, hospital. Reti- sorry, American retirement home. Is that what it's? You called? know that's coming. Um, I'm going there. Um, <laughs> but um, but she's very nurse ratchet. Like she's she's terrifying, but still you know red lipstick and quaffed hair, and that sort of that sort of carries her through. Um, she's also very dynasty in many ways. Yeah. Well. This is a soap opera. It's absolutely it's a, horror soap. a soap opera. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a soap opera for horror fans. You, you've nailed it on the head. And I think that's why, you know, we can discuss things about race and feminism and all this kind of stuff, but that's not what it's for. It's not a show that is meant to do any more than it's doing, which is to tell us some fun, campy stories and hopefully honor our, our ideals and our morals along the way. And it's not too aggressively going in the opposite direction. But it's not there to progress the narrative of racism or feminism or anything like that. It's just there to tell it's a story, still I think. tries to tackle them, though. Which it I n- does. Which I never know whether to hold against IHS or whether to sort of commend it for trying. <gasps> because it tries to... Well, like, all of them... Like, you go to Asylum and it's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. People who are crazy are bad, obviously. Uh, and cra- crazy's the devil. But and... then there's aliens in, a, in Asylum. So it kind yeah, of gets all of it Well, But this is what I mean, is that, like, you can't, you can't really... Yes, it tries to tackle these issues because of drama and this kind of stuff. But it's like it's then, like a very middling student writing an essay on a very important topic. And you're like, well, you've done the Wikipedia page. Like, exactly. you're not wrong. You just haven't done anything deeper than is acceptable. Yeah. The thing that I always struggle with is kind of trying to understand what is it trying to say about those issues that it's tackling. Nothing new. <laughs> yeah. So, like, in the first episode, it tackles, like, campus rape. Because Absolutely. Madison gets roofied and gang raped well, by a bunch of frat boys. And even the depiction, you know, it's it's bizarre to say this now, but even the depiction of, of female characters and the prevalence of female characters with consent and the absence of consent. Like, consent was a major issue throughout that first season. Mm. Um, from older characters, younger characters, male characters, female characters, gay characters, straight characters. Like, everybody was not giving their consent in the first series, and that's a lot of where the horror came from. But where does it go from there? It's just like, mm, not giving consent is bad. Okay, we all agree with you there. 
oh no that's it okay that's the entire message and i i think that's the thing with american horror story i think you know like with the uh, freak show it's uh well you know prejudging people who look different than you is bad and then the rest of it's all a bit like, <laughs> like it's like and that's know. it and then and then from there we're just sort of killing people and that's cool and you know bad people die and good people die and that's you know no, it's drama. You, you could argue the freak show also tries to tackle like class issues yeah no f- i yeah. mean it tries but this is again it tries <laughs> right it's like class issues are bad doesn't try very hard does it and then it's like mm, but they happen though don't they well but but you could and at- here it's a bit like aging is bad and that's what makes this series a little bit problematic yeah. is it makes the issue uh, that losing losing your youthfulness, mm. um, the male characters, oh my God, the male characters are reborn ghosts. They're corpses who are stitched back together. They have bull heads. They're all still super sexy. We're are not concerned. Well, no, but you like people still not being funny. People still want to fuck all of them. Yeah, that's fair enough. They actually do. Yeah, right. But like, not just want to, but like are into it. Like, kill Let, people for them. Let's talk about the male characters for a, sec- for a second. So we've got Mary Lavelle's lover, mm. who I don't actually believe gets a name at all. Bullhead, bullhead man. He's literally, <laughs> I think, in the credits, he's referred to as the Minotaur. Mom, I'm in a, I'm in an HBO series. <laughs> Are you, honey? Yeah, you can see, you can see my head for two seconds at the beginning, and then I'm a bull. Uh, no, he did, like he's great. He did, you know, and the makeup's great, and it works. It works, but he is literally objectified from second one. Literally, he doesn't even get a name. No, he gets he gets no identity whatsoever. And then we've got. I'll get to Kyle in a second, but we've got Hank, who is the husband. The right? husband, who is a witch hunter. It is revealed, and and I love I love how she's so super clairvoyant. She doesn't know her husband's a witch hunter. Yeah, that like, that. Does like get it's, some sort of explanation, but it's, it's never really explained. But yeah, and this is where again it's just camp. Like just accept yeah. that this has happened. Don't and question it. Don't question it. Just yeah. lean in. Lean in. But yeah, so he's a bad dude. He kills a lot of women and wants to kill her eventually. But he's also kind of a loser. He's a loser in his, you know, with her. Fiona very clearly despises him from the minute she met him. She makes it very clear in every single interaction. And then, like, he's also kind of a loser in his witch hunting corporation. And he's a he's a trust fund kid, sort of. Yeah. Like his dad owns the corporation, and he's seen as a bit of a failure, and, and he's meant to have killed more witches by now. He's sort of like the Kendall Roy. <laughs> <laughs> he's the total Kendall coming. Roy. He's totally the Kendall Roy. Although, um, you know, Kendall Roy is... An unbelievably well written character. Oh my god, that whole series. We can't we you can't even make comparisons because yeah, when you get when I mean, you get characters who are so well developed versus or very very entertaining but cookie cutter <laughs> characters that we have here. Well, and I think even his demise, so he it's described in a really weird way. It's described as sort of this male rage that he is so angry at the notion of his wife being injured or done poor you know done wrong by that he shows his male power by attacking the hairdressing salon where the voodoo witches all live and stay and he's shooting all of them and then gets killed because queenie's awesome um, i don't think it's even about his wife it's because of his dad well it's rage though it's meant to be like a rage shooting rather yeah. than like it's like impotent male rage is the reason why he's killed all these women rather than because he's trying to be a badass witch hunter and it's just slightly strange that they don't need to give him that motive they don't need to say he did it because he was an angry man and these are women they could have just said he's a witch hunter because they'd already established that trust fund kid with daddy issues yes and they they decide to take that narrative to its inevitable conclusion, which is a sort of school shooting metaphor where he goes into the, the hairdressers and just Once kills again, everybody. When a white man literally murders mm-hmm. a whole space full of black women. And there's no there's no addressing what happens in the world after that as well. There's like this entire there's like eight people shot up in this in this beauty salon and there's no addressing that this has happened whatsoever after the fact. It's just done now. Yep. It's We've like, removed these characters because we need to wrap up this season. Exactly. Bye-bye. But again, there's no heavy lifting in this series. Like no. if 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 you look at it and your criticism is it didn't handle that topic particularly politically correctly, it's like, well, 
it doesn't like it's don't not have succession. that expectation it doesn't do it don't yeah. you know watch something else this is just there doing the bare minimum in and a fun way it's but, always fun but yeah. in the bare minimum like it's not going to make you feel culturally uplifted after you watch it don't think anyone's ever used that <laughs> combination of words about AHS anything. It's true. It's true. Um, and then we've got Kyle, who's played by Evan Peters, also AHS regular, mm-hmm. also has appeared in every single season except season nine. And he's he's kind of reprising his role from season one a little bit, where it's it's character we don't know very well, dies while pursuing female character, and then becomes undead, impotent, rage, murderer not murderer better not better he's sort okay of like, by the end he's sort of like presented as a good jock a good frat boy you know he's the sober one when they go to the frat party <laughs> he's the one who doesn't get a tattoo he's the one who's like the sober one of them when the designated driver basically when they go to a frat mm. party then he's also the one who tries to l- stop the stop rape. the rape and gets them all on the bus. But is that is off. that good or is that just not shitty? Like again, I mean, it is not shitty. The bar is very low for those. I know, boys. right? Like it's sort of like, well, you just need to. And and is his name Kyle? Yeah. Because <gasps> there's this whole meme, isn't there, about Kyle drinking like punching walls and drinking Monster Energy drink, right? <laughs> there's that whole metaphor of what Kyle is, and I feel like we've just set the bar as low as a Kyle <laughs> for being a basic basic dude. He is a very basic dude. He does have like you know this is episode one where he has this whole <laughs> monologue with zoe where he's like oh you know i'm I'm not like all of them I'm you know i'm here God. in a scholarship i'm like i'm I wanna, from the ninth ward yeah i want to build all these things to rebuild new orleans mm. Stuff i'm like so that. hopeful yeah <laughs> i and hope then, i don't die in, in 20 minutes so he's dead yeah. in the first episode <laughs> and he gets rebuilt so we only really get kyle's head and then the rest of him is stronger, better, faster, more tattooed, and with a bigger dick, apparently. Apparently, yeah. Again, courtesy of Madison, Madison. like, building a perfect boyfriend. So so this is such a weird, hilarious evidence of the male writing in this, is the idea that whenever they're talking about these men, they're always like, well, good thing he's got a big old dick. And it's like, that's such a male way to look at good sex. It's like... Oh, well, as long as he's got a massive unit, I know I'll be satisfied. It's like, that is not how sex works. That is literally just not how sex works. You know, it's part of the equation, but, you know, we got to look at the sum of the whole situation. And and the idea that they honestly, so many times in this story, just refer to be like, oh, no, but he's got a big dick, though, right? And not just with Ryan, uh, uh, sorry, Kyle. Um, they do it with the, with the slave characters, with the husband, with, they do it with all of the characters who are men. Yeah. And there is an element of sort of reverse objectification there, if, you know, such a thing exists. But, um, but I believe the term is thirst. (laughs) There you go. Thirst. I believe the term is thirsty. (laughs) Thirsty. But then also it's, it would be the same thing as saying like, ooh, Ooh, he's got a lot of pubic hair, doesn't he? Ooh, sexy, sexy, masculine pubic hair. Love me what... You know, it's like, it's just this random thing that sort of boys talk about in a locker room as being important when they're 14, but actually is so irrelevant to the process as a whole. Like, big one, small one, you, you know, do your magic. Like, it's fine. But again, just goes to like male sort of perspective. And he's like, girls like a big dick though, right? Like, let's make them have a big dick. They'd give them a big dick, I think. Maybe I'm giving Murphy too much credit (laughs) here. But I want to say that maybe this kind of puts in evidence the fact that Madison is such a broken character where... She doesn't there's probably that, I mean, does yeah, not know good sex. So she's just honest, like, oh, yeah. big, <laughs> she's big, like, dick. big dick. She's like, big dick. Doll do. Doll do. Big dick. Let's do it. Yeah. Totally cool. She's like a bro. She's such she a, bro. a bro. But they do it with other male characters as well. And I think I think if it was just Madison saying it, I think I think we could we could forgive it just being about her. I just think the writers are going, what a, what a lady's like in a guy. Big dick. Right. I'll put that in. Like, I mean... To be said, if you've watched the entirety of American Horror Story, <laughs> which I presume you haven't because you're a woman I've of good yeah, taste. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> and you've got other things to do. I've got a lot going on. Uh, I'm um, just not to say I won't do it tomorrow, but let's find out. <laughs> there is a very particular type of young, beautiful, dark-haired, blue-eyed man that yeah. is tended to be favored. Like a lot of big penises in this series, um, <laughs> is what I'm hearing from, from you. Uh 
I'm just saying they got dark hair and blue eyes and they've got a particular build. But yeah, no, it definitely, it definitely doesn't, you know, it's about all these women. And I'm- what is interesting, though, is that we get quite a lot of instances in this series of like women abusing men. Well, physically, like, yeah. and, and very much psychologically. But there's there's always a, a tinge of um, a revenge to it, which is, which is again, slightly, you know, fine. But it's, it's, the women seem to be provoked at all times. Like, there's nobody who just wantonly attacks men. Even, even, um... Well, Kyle's mom. Oh, Kyle's mom. Them. Yeah, no. See, I and keep forgetting the... about Kyle's mom right there. <laughs> and then the neighbor's to mom. A popcorn during that scene. Um, <laughs> and then the neighbor's mom. Oh, yeah. Also she's also, like, a, she's, she's she... giving him uh, Enema. enemas for no reason. With because bleach? Is that what we're to understand? I just, I feel, I don't know. Real I feel like Ryan needs to have a chat in a safe space. I think with that, Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> he, and, he and Jessica need to sit and have a, a chat in a safe space and just get some stuff out in the open because I don't know why all these women are putting stuff in the butts of young men i don't all these mothers all these mothers as well like what is that about well let's talk about the competition and the mother element in the series because there is a lot of that i feel like i feel like that is genuinely represented as well i feel like the mother (laughs) issues in this is like no no that i get that is completely accurate um yeah no there's a lot of you know jessica lang says brilliantly at one point um i died when you were born and it's like you know i remember that birthday it's sort of but um but it's it's a very intense mummy dearest sort of relationship which is classic to horror films i think as well there's this real fear of the mother and the and the daughter um and i think that works both on the male and the female side like this fear of the of the mother taking over you again it's one of those things that it's so very present and it works super well and then they just keep trying to make it mean more. And you're like, no, no, no. You had it back in episode four. You don't need to take it any further. <laughs> um, and I love the way it's resolved in the last scene. But it just it just sort of keeps hitting the same note over and over and over and over and over again for about eight episodes. Um, but one of the things I do really, really like about it is uh, they are literally in competition. Rather than it just having to be the downtrodden daughter whose mother is constantly abusing her. It is actually a back and forth for the duration of the series. She never trusts her mother. Yeah, and then there is there is a literal competition amongst all of the witches. <laughs> yes. So kind of the, the idea Seven of, Wonders. Yeah. Which is a Stevie Nicks song conveniently. And it's just obviously Stevie Nicks wrote the song because she's a witch and knows the Seven Wonders. I mean, obviously this is named The Seven Wonders because Ryan really wanted Stevie Nicks to appear in here. I love the Stevie Nicks bit in it. I didn't know <laughs> Did how much you? I liked Stevie Nicks until she was in this show. I was like, oh shit, I'm really into Stevie Nicks. I don't want to dance around with a scarf in the wind. Like, it... It doesn't. Right? Like, it, it, it created these really, like, I'm a free woman with beachy locks of hair and And again you know kind of tapping into the the real life pop culture that stevie nicks is a white witch and all of this you know i was talking to an old friend of mine the other day telling her all about you she just begged me to come have a sit down with you she's a white witch and try as i may i cannot get her to play in the shadows with me How are you? You must be Misty. I'm Stevie Nicks. (laughs) Is she all right? (laughs) You owe me five bucks. I told you she was going to do that. So she's kind of practicing witch, but she's not in the the competitive coverness of it all which is which they never really explain but she just shows up does a few songs (laughs) does a few numbers she's she's friends with jessica it's like hey let's do it let's hey let's do a little number over here on the corner uh get on the piano play the ivories but they literally compete with each other it's great because it's it's like they (laughs) the pacing on it's a bit funny so they build up to these seven wonders that they have to perform to prove that they can be the supreme and there's all this stuff about what do you need to do to be the Supreme and how can you be the Supreme? And it's like, okay, well, you have to be in perfect health. 
but it turns out if you die and then come back to life, then your health is restored entirely. So that's kind of wipes out any problem with Madison. Uh, and then it's like, no, 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 but you have to do these seven things. It's like, oh, but the other witches can only do one thing. I don't know. Turns out they can all do many things. They're all very good at many things. But then they've got their kind of special designated powers. Their special power. Their, their Xavier powers as well. And then they start going through the the seven wonders. I'm trying to remember the first. It was the first. The first one was the candle, and they have to pull the candle towards them. So it's like telekinetically, telekinesis, the ancient pyrokinesis, uh, something else, something else. They need to come bring someone back from the dead. That's a biggie. They need to go down to the afterlife and then go back well, up. And this is the one that kills. Uh, is it Millie? What's her Misty name? Day. Misty Day. Yeah, and it's like we haven't talked about Misty Day at all. I like Misty. She's the swamp witch. A swamp witch, but like prettier than any swamp witch I've ever imagined like she's super lovely like very full of life and like very she's very stevie spring, nicks spring very stevie nicks obsessed with stevie nicks as well probably yep. uh, uh, a bit madly shunned so. by the community uh and and lives out and and also again like a really tragic story uh we start with her being burned at the stake in the woods and she's just some girl who got burnt in the woods in modern times and yeah just sort people, of left there for us because people saw her bring back a little frog or a little bird to life and they were like burn the witch yeah so that that's happened like 10 years previously or something um but she's super good at bringing people back to life so she's come back using swamp mud uh which she should bottle and sell apparently and um and she's great she's kind of a bit ditzy but she's she's a bit um Who's the one in Harry Potter who's the crazy? Luna. Luna. She's totally Luna from Harry Potter. And it's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Uh, and everybody thinks she's going to be the supreme because she's got the ability to bring people back to life and she uses it all the time and it's really easy. Uh, but then she fucks it. And she fucks it really early on. And this is this is uh, in the competition. Yeah. Everybody else does this thing. I won't say which one, just to keep that edge of mystery. Um everyone else does the the wonder uh and she's the only one of the four competing who isn't able to do it and it's a bit like oh and that's it and and then she literally turns to dust it was like oh well she was she was the front runner up until just now and that was a bit deus ex machina but uh i guess we're in the second to last episode so we better turn through these guys um but yeah, and then as we go through this, they're a bit arbitrary. They're fun to watch, but they're a bit yeah. arbitrary. Because the next character who meets their demise just ends up, they're, they're um, teleporting. And, and she, that's Zoe. Uh, yeah, and she bamps herself onto a, uh, you know, Nightcrawler bamps. They're basically bamfing. That's, you know, that's the sound <laughs> it makes. Uh, they bamf, uh, she bamps onto the top of a fence uh, post and impales herself. Like, well... You know, no other time did anybody even remotely go to a place that wasn't where, exactly where they intended. They didn't even go a couple feet up in the air. And this is like eight feet up in the air. She's magicked herself up to to kill herself. So it all felt a bit like convenient. inconsistent with the narrative. Yeah, very convenient, very inconsistent with the narrative. But it got us to where we need to get. What we need to get is that Cordelia ends up being the new Supreme. And okay. she performs. And she was previously characterized as being quite meek. Mm. Um, very much kind of controlled or put upon by her mother very much kind of you know a potions lady as opposed to a Actually, intuitive magic yeah she doesn't she never really presents herself or is presented as being overly powerful but rather like very much kind of in the background Book smart yes that's a good way to put it yeah. she's not street smart she's not She's not intuitively witchy, she, but she's read all the books, so she yeah, can make it work. Yeah, she also kind of doesn't have that kind of um, authority mm. that Fiona has, and that we're told that Fiona always had, even or as grandness. a young witch. Like, no. she's very mousy, sort of, comparatively yeah. to the other she's people. She's very warm, very kind, she's very committed to the cause, she wants to do well by her students. And quite asexual, not able to have children uh, with her yeah. witch hunter husband. Well, she's not asexual, because she does fuck her husband. Do we? But do they? Do they only do it to have the baby? That like it's very mechanical. Yeah. Like, and she doesn't lust after. Like, there's no point where she's like, mm, "That's I'm true." Get me some of that side piece. Like, there's no, no. She's very kind of focused on the school and the coven as yeah. opposed to. She's the career lady. Yeah, she is. <laughs> she's the yeah. career lady, and it's yeah, and the whole. Yeah. You know, this brings us back into a slightly problematic of fertility and the importance of fertility and whether being fertile makes you a woman or not and babies. Which, which again, 
hinted at, not really explored. Not explored, and you have to just go, okay, they brought it up, but they didn't finish the conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which, again, there's a lot of that throughout this, so I think if you can just... There's <laughs> a lot of that throughout of Ryan Murphy's oeuvre. <laughs> it's true! And if you can just kind of accept that he's going to bring something up and then just go, anyway... Yeah, I changed my mind now. I'm interested in exactly. something else. Like, oh, shiny. So, uh, racism, right? Anyway. <laughs> uh, so female suffrage, right? Never mind. Like, he just he just quick swerves across an issue. And it's like, as the, if we've discussed it, we've covered it, right? Like, that's fine. If we brought it up as... And I'd rather it was on screen than not. Like, I'd rather it was being depicted than not. It's still better to have issues brought up and inadequately explored than not brought up at all. But yeah, don't don't expect this to be the big mind changer of of feminism or anything like that. It's just a bit of fun more than anything. How do you think it kind of shows witches as outcasts? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think one of the main morals to this is that uh if you ever feel outcast, there is a community of outcasts for you. And which is like, you know, just fucking ice cream for a horror fan it's like oh i love my people who are also weird like me you know that's all of us so that's that's brilliant for us um but it also uh doesn't really look at it beyond a sort of christianity witching community because we don't see them as rejected in their community because they're not out so there's not really any kind of presentation of that until the very end uh, at which point we see this big huge crowd of women who all feel outcast from their communities and want to come be a part of the school so the idea of coming together is really well represented but i'm not sure they really sit too long with the idea of being outcast and there is a lot of kind of open questions for me about how the coven actually functions like how are they funded <laughs> where does a fiona, lot of questions where do you where cook? does, where does like, fiona get all her clothes from there's How a lot of questions about this. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate because a lot of other series really do spend that like Supernatural really well addresses all this kind of stuff. Like there's a load of series that are happy to address all this kind of stuff. And they just do not give two fucks an American horror story. As long as Jessica Lang wears those Labutons. Exactly. Well, exactly. Good. It is just and and you kind of accept, well, she just conjures them or she makes somebody buy them for her or this kind of stuff, but it really isn't dealt with. We don't know where she lives when she's not been in that house. Like I imagine she just lives in like hotels around the world. Like five star hotels. Just fabulous yeah. places. It's very specific that they choose New Orleans as the setting of this. And in the previous uh in the first season it was LA and in the second one I forget where it was set, in Asylum. Uh but this is very much capitalizing on New Orleans as a creepy Mm. Town is a city very much kind of seeped in history and seeped in dark history. Like it's it's kind of presented as the most haunted city in America, well, isn't it, it? It definitely is. And I think there, you know, Southern Gothic mm. is a thing. And you know, New Orleans itself, you've got Spanish moss dangling from from trees, you've got the fog creeping in from the river, you've got the beautiful old French iron from all the the architecture. You've got all of these design points that uh, give you this sort of place out of time. Uh, and then the other side is it's mostly a tourist city. So it's all about drinking and having fun. And then you get the fact that it was a, a slave port. So voodoo came in through there and a lot of the French silks and finery came in through there. So it's it's a city that's designed to be interesting. It's, you know, it's it's where uh, Interview with a Vampire decided to open its historical story. It's a sexy time. It's pretty. It's nice. But it's also got all this horribleness happening just under the under the, the surface. Um, but modern New Orleans, we've got post-Katrina. Uh, and they, again, they mention that he's from the 9th District. Uh, Kyle. But we never really get back into that. And if I'm perfectly honest, the representation of his area is much better off uh, than the areas that were hit by the flood. So it's a little bit sort of like whitewashy. Um, but otherwise, the city itself is given throughout a huge point of pride. You know, the axe man kills people who don't listen to jazz. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, unusually, the food is not really 
like explored, which is a huge part of Louisiana. And going out and drinking and partying is an explored, which is a huge part of Louisiana. So just like with many things, they're not going deep into Louisiana culture and this, that, and the other. They're just deciding this is a nice place to put it. We'll stay on the surface. It's a lovely backdrop. We'll pick what we want and then leave the rest. Does anyone even get eaten by an alligator? No. Right? Well, no. Yeah. Do they? Well, Misty lives in the swamp. Oh, there's that bit where she she gets up, uh, she falls upon the poachers and yeah. reincarnates some of the alligators. Yeah. So, mm, she does do that. And it's like episode one or two. And yeah. then we never come back to alligators, which not being funny, big deal. Big yeah, deal. Actual there's a lot predator. of them. They're, they're about. Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't want a mess. You don't want a mess. But yeah, so, so Louisiana, fantastic character beautifully beautifully depicted lovely architecture but again it just sort of just sort of drifted over more than anything else i would say to wrap up on kind of a bit more on the fun side because above all if we've established anything is that this is just fun it's just fun like just have some fun that's all it is exactly um what what were your favorite bits oh okay i love melon bold eyes that is an image that will stick with me because I remember my mom using the melon baller when I was a kid and it does run through your mind that like you could totally scoop someone's eye out with this and I think I really only want to be friends with people who've had that thought um uh oh god the tongue being cut out toes being cut off there's a lot of evisceration in this that I couldn't actually watch um oh my god Kathy Bates dresses I love her dresses throughout the whole, like the flashback dresses where she's like, I am living my Victorian dream. Um, she is in a fantasy. Her bustle is, brings all the boys to the yard. Um, but cause they spent some time on those dresses. They're really beautifully done. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot to look at throughout. And Madison's super hot swanning around in all her classy witch gear. I mean, she's far from classy, is she? Um, no, but you know what I mean. <laughs> she's doing she's doing her she, Hollywood like she's I'm doing, a sexy bitch. She's like, doing her be- best basic bitch witch. Super basic bitch witch. Oh, so completely. Um, and like I said, like the Stevie Nicks bits are fun as well because I didn't realize I like Stevie Nicks. Um, and so there's there's just all these little treasures, and I think that's what makes you want to keep going from episode to episode. But again, if you leave it for too long, the threads are so loose that they're quite easy to drop. Um, so I think all the reasons I love it are the same reasons that you do have to watch it in fairly strict sequences or you can lose interest because it is just that surface playing. Nothing wrong with that. Super fun. Lovely to watch. But if you're not willing to digest it as a whole piece, yeah, it's like a greedy cake. Like, like you're like, this is great. I'm going to finish the whole thing. And if you don't finish it all at one go, you come back, you're like, it wasn't that good. I don't think I want to eat the rest of this. You're like, I don't know what happens at the end of that cake. Um, that's, oh, that's such a perfect way of describing every single American Horror Story <laughs> season that's ever been. And yet I keep coming back I to know, that. I know, right? Because cake is good. <laughs> <laughs> I love me some cake. Um, it's so just true, though. Keep eating it's completely the true. Cake. I just keep eating it. I don't know why. They're like, guess what? We got a new cake. All the same ingredients, different frosting. I tell you why. Sarah Paulson. <laughs> and they're like, and that's one of those why. ingredients is Sarah Paulson. <laughs> She did the icing. Um, <laughs> she is the icing. She is the icing. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Super fair enough. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with you totally. Like, they're just these little variables of things that are nice and consumable, like petty fours, you know? Like, they're just these sort of little munchable little bits. And it's a series that's best, um, that exists almost better as gifts than it does as a show. Yeah, yeah. Like, give it to somebody to watch over a weekend. Like, it's like a binge, you know? It's like, let's go hang out and watch American Horror Story this weekend and order in some pizzas and you have a great time. And there's some episodes in the middle where you're both like on your phone and not really paying attention. And then you go, wait a minute, what? And then somebody's dead and you didn't know that happened. <laughs> and somebody got raped by their mom that you didn't know happened. And then you talk about it awkwardly in a podcast. Um, but that's what makes them fun as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes them fun. Uh, I definitely didn't expect to spend that much time on the mom rape. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, I like to I like to take any mistakes I make and just really put them into focus. So <laughs> that's that's how I do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this was so much fun to do. Thank almost you very just much for as, having me. Almost as much fun as watching the series. I oh, know, oh, right? Fun. But we didn't go too deep, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what Ryan would want. It's exactly. It's like we weren't being we directed were by Ryan Murphy. We were respecting his his approach. his vision. Exactly, yes. respecting his vision. Absolutely. Jen, thanks so much. Where can uh, people find more of your work? Uh, so I am on Twitter uh, more than I should be, at Jay Handorf. Uh, and you can find out what I'm doing there. Uh, currently uh, working on a feature film that takes all of the experience of menopause and makes them into a horrible supernatural experience, which they're not far off from being anyway. So... See what people think of that when it comes out. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye. And that's it for another episode of the Final Girls Podcast. Please do leave us a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. You can find out more about what we do on thefinalgirls.co.uk and follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at thefinalgirls.uk. You can also follow Jen on Twitter at jhandorf and I am on Anna B. Demented. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for more witchy goodness next week.